the Big Money Podcast. It's your window into outlier stocks and what really moves markets. Don't follow the news. Follow the Big Money. Wood, and it's three, two, and one. Welcome to the Big Money Podcast. And always remember, don't follow the news. Follow the Big Money. I am one of your hosts, Lucas Downey, and I'm with the esteemed and my best friend, Jason Bodner. Say hello. Co-host, hello. How are you today? I'm doing awesome. This has been an exciting time because we have another leveraged event. And so that's what's going to make this podcast a little bit different. Instead of having like the outlier segment, we are going to have the outlier event um, which was Archegos Capital Management. They had this big blow up. People are hearing about it. Uh, I think we go into that. Then, then we'll go as our second step. Mm. You and I have actually, a lot of people may not even know this, that we not only you know handled big buy order flow, we also handled big, big blow ups, sell <laughs> order flow, like literal yeah. liquidation. So I think we can give some insights to people of what actually happens when you get a big, big, big sell order that needs to get done immediately. What happens? And then lastly, I think the third thing is we're going to talk about the data. What is it saying? And just give people a little bit of that love. And if we have time for a stock, we'll do that. So I'm tired of rapping about it. You have been looking into what's been going on with this, or at least what we think we know, what's been reported on Archegos Capital Management. Doesn't this bring back some memories a little bit? Yeah, it does. So let's quickly go over what's rocking markets and causing volatility and selling a lot of tums, presumably, because <laughs> um, when big, fat, leveraged funds get caught the wrong way around, really nasty things can happen. So what's going on, right? Um, Headed into last week, we saw some news hitting the tape that China was reconsidering regulation on how local companies collect data. Uh, That caused a lot of panic, you know, knee-jerk selling, which put pressure on a lot of Chinese ADRs, you know, big uh, strong companies, internet companies, music companies, financials companies, all these different companies. If you were Chinese, you got hit. It just hurt. Yep. Just guilt by association yep. with nothing that was even proven guilty, right? <laughs> and then uh, news hit later in the week that there was some unsubstantiated rumor, I think on Thursday, that Chinese ADRs could face delisting by the New York Stock Exchange. This is nonsense. That was the story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That yeah, was so the story. It's just a stocks that went down 20% in a day went down another 20%. And it was just mayhem and ugliness. And then Friday came the death knell for one big fun. Uh, I think it is pre- still presumed to be and widely accepted to be Archegos. Is that how we pronounce it? With the I think fund that's manager. That you Bill. talk about. You know, uh, we always talk about big funds leave footprints. They left a huge <laughs> crater, huge <laughs> crater. I mean, yeah. some of these stocks were just sent to oblivion. But you and I know this because we're one of the few people that have actually handled chunks of selling like this. But again, yeah, let's let's just finish that. Keep going. Yeah, let's finish what happened. So uh, Bill Wang, I think, is a fund manager. He's an ex manager of a Julian Robinson, one of the Tiger Cubs. He ran Tiger Asia. He got into some trouble there, but he really liked to use leverage, excessive leverage. And supposedly he entered into CFDs. Let's just quickly go into what a CFD is. It's a derivative. Derivative. It's an over-the-counter contract between a big bank and a fund. Let's say I'm a fund and I want to invest... I want to own $50 million worth of stock, but I only have $5 million to buy it. Well, I want to put on a leverage play. I'll go say to my broker, hey, I'll give you $5 million of collateral to control $50 million worth of stock. The bank goes and buys the stock in the bank's name, not my name. And they hold it and they're like, fine, dude. If the stock goes up, I'll give you money. Right. And the stock goes up and the bank gives me money in my account and I feel awesome. 
And there's the just this whole swap process that goes. Right. So it's like you make the gains, we're going to swap, you know, you'll see the gains. You're going to be paying us a little bit of interest for that. That's what the bank, I'm the banker in this, uh, in this um, example that you're talking about. Yeah. And it's uh, it, exactly right. It's a swap, uh, cash for difference. So you're literally changing cash every day for the difference in the synthetic position. That's right. So the problem is, right? If I hold $50 million worth of stock, but I only pledged 5 million bucks and the stock drops 10%, well, I'm wiped out, right? Yeah. And if it drops 20%, Luke, you're calling me up and saying- uh, Ring, ring, ring. <laughs> hey, do you have my $10 million? Hey. You got to pledge initial hey. collateral. Margins on the line. Right. You get a margin uh, call. You get a margin call. And when you get a margin call from multiple big banks- and they all realize that I can't pay. Guess what? You're hitting the sell button. Everybody is exiting like rats off a sinking ship. It is ugly. <laughs> they, they, they just want to, you know, turn that, you know, death position. They don't want it to get any worse. So they just have to raise cash. And so they just have to force sell just big, big chunks of stock. And they will do it in a day. Uh, and we saw this on Friday. I mean, yeah, you I didn't call know. me up. You're like, Jay, this is getting stupid. I didn't Look know. At these prices. I knew something was going on, but I didn't know what was going on. I just knew that mm. whenever you start to see stuff down 40, 50 percent, um, typically that is a forced liquidation. Typically that is get me done immediately. I want to be done. Hit the bids. And I, I can to this day, I don't want to, you know, jump the gun here. I remember some of those orders when we were back in the, the GFC, it was just get it done best way. You know, you got five minutes. Well, I think this is a great segue to talk about how it was handling those liquidations, but more importantly, why does a stock with no particular major news event and those news events that I just talked about at China, those aren't major news events. Those are like you know, let's rattle the cage in an illiquid, low, vo you know, low volume, high volatility situation. The, the businesses haven't changed, right? If yep. let's just say hypothetically, I'm a Chinese internet firm. I'm still servicing potentially a billion people of internet products. The business didn't change suddenly overnight. So what causes a stock to go down 40 to 50% a day on not a lot of news. And I think you just hit the head on the, on you hit the hit, nail hit, on the head. Yeah. Like, hit the head with the nail, whatever it eventually it is, came out. Mean. It eventually yes. came out, but yeah. So you're the broker, you're the bank. You say, sorry, Jay, you can't meet margin. We're liquidating your portfolio. The bank turns around and calls executing broker. That was us back yep. in the day. You remember we handled more than one liquidation with some pretty big names. We're not going to go into names, but literally, and especially we handled derivatives, listed options. These were exchange traded options, but some of the contracts just didn't trade that much in a given day. Oh, and it, they would say, hit the bid and the markets were volatile. The spreads had already widened out. And you're talking about a 30 to 40% difference on the option. Yeah, in like a minute because there's no liquidity and it yeah. just didn't matter. You it, know? it 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 was, and if we go back to to that, and I still to this day, Jason, I still have memories. I get flashbacks all the time of just how toxic it was, and I loved my job, but it became, you know, the selling pressure that you know all these firms were were going under one by one you know, we'd come in one day and we'd have these lines. So people that are listening, um, we would have direct lines to not only the exchanges, the floors, but also to some of our biggest clients, other banks. And um, you'd come in one day and the line was just gone. You know, these yeah. are people that I spoke to every single day for, for years, every day, you know, and we got it, you got on the horn, you let them know, you exchange your pleasantries. Hey, how you doing, Bill? Um, you know, I'm here if you need anything, blah, 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 Bas basically was there because there was so much orders they, they needed to use us. But 
Um, to this day, I still get flashbacks of some of those liquidations because Friday they're there. Yeah. Monday they're not. <laughs> Monday they're not. And there was, you know, to talk about just how ugly the selling pressure was in a handful of names this past Friday, it brought back a memory of uh, one of our salesmen on the desk had gotten a big book to liquidate. And this was, you know, a high level thing. And there were so many orders and this was at the end of the day, it may have been like 3 PM. So markets close an hour later, he may have gotten two orders, all of us literally. And I think there were 14 of us, you know, and this is back in the day when you had paper tickets. So it wasn't like electronic. You actually had to write it on hands, uh, hands, you know, and then <laughs> literally pass it around. And everybody just got on the horn. I mean, got on your phone, uh, got, you know, you're pushing your buttons and you had to get these orders done. And, you know, you were doing a lot of this manually and it, it got to the point where people start to, you know, freak out because you're getting down to the last final minutes. We have to get done by end of day. It was crisis. And then we, uh, and we finally get it all done. You go home and you feel like you have been beaten down, right? People are like, oh, you work out today? No, no, literally just liquidated some funds or whatever. And um, back to what you were saying a moment ago, where some of these prices get so dislocated. One of the orders I remember, he went the wrong way by accident. Mm. And I, when you're I in a remember that <laughs> when you're in a fast market, you know, and options, even if they're they are trading in points, if you sell at one dollar, whenever you were supposed to buy it at say three dollars, you know, we have to unwind it. And you know, the losses can be just absolutely ginormous because the liquidity just vanishes. So yeah, there were days where we had trading losses equal to a very nice house, I recall. Yes. <laughs> but yep. you know, to your point, how does that happen? Right. And I remember you had a verbal argument with someone on the desk and they were like, there is no way this firm is going out of business. The value of their real estate alone is worth $2 billion. And you're like, yeah, but if you owe 20 billion oh, and there was just silence, that's and but that was the time. And yeah. to your point, Friday, when you see major price dislocations like that, back to Archegos, a sell order supposedly of $20 billion worth of various stocks hit the street. If there's just not a lot of buyers, we're gonna talk about the data in a second and how we've been seeing buyers vanishing and selling picking up so if the bids aren't even there to begin with and then yeah. you got to go crush you know multiples of the daily volume to get out and there's no bids the stock is has only one place to go and that's down yeah. temporarily and honestly if it's a outlier potential stock with great sales and earnings what happens luke calls me up he's like jay i gotta get in there I, I, you know, these prices are stupid. They're not going out of business. We're not going to see a deal like this in a long time. It feels gross. I feel sick to my stomach. Yeah. But that's what we got to do. And it, it, you have to know what you're doing. Obviously, I'm not suggesting any of you run out and try and catch falling knives because you want to be really well informed on potential outlier stocks feeling pressure in the market, but they, they tend to be opportunities looking back <laughs> months from now, but right now, yeah, it feels ugly. It's causing volatility. And then the newspaper headlines come out and some analysts say, this is just the beginning, you know, cause they like to stoke the flames. But I knew once you were sending me, uh, headlines and sort of the, the rumors are coming out about a big fund liquidation. Once that news hits, that's kind of, it's the end, the right? window the, of opportunity basically closes immediately. Shut. Yeah. So right for the same reason that we talk about all the time, if big money is going to buy a great stock, they're not running out on CNBC. They're not telling their friends, they're not telling anybody, they're telling their broker, be as quiet as possible as you can about it. Don't move the stock. I don't want to let anyone know what I'm doing yeah. because if they go spray the street with their knowledge and they try and pump up a stock before they bought it, they're fighting themselves. 
this is the same exact thing. Like they don't want the news getting out. It's just in the other direction. They don't want the news getting out of a liquidation. People probably already know on the inside circle already. Yeah. But once the news becomes widespread, it, it's most likely over. So uh, that I think is, that's it, what you said on the phone. Uh, sorry to cut you off. You're like, if it's hitting the news and it's, it's over, it's done. And, you know, we just have learned that from experience. You know, once the headlines are out, you know, you always hear uh, buy the rumor, sell the news, you know, in this, you know, in the event where something is free falling, it could ultimately be an opportunity because, you know, people, um, they sell into uncertainty. And once certainty is there, or at least people can start to put the pieces together, kind of like when the pandemic came, you know, there was no clarity on when this virus was going to get over. But uh, basically within days after they announced that they were going to start closing up some of these cities, some of these towns, Wall Street said, okay, there's probably a, a, a timetable that we're going to get uh, back to normal. And so that's whenever the buyers started to come in and right. it tends Liquidity to work that way. Yeah. yeah. And it, and it's true. And it's like trying to time the market with the news. Uh, I feel like that's a really frustrating game to play. Uh, what does our data say about it? Our data says there was pressure on some great stocks, Yeah, but if we go back and we'll see in a minute, uh, we're going to look at a stock. I, I think we should have time for it. You can do a time check for us and, Make sure we're on our checklist, but check, check, check. Sometimes you get red sell signals on great stocks. And if you look back over time, they just end up being the gift you wish you had paid attention to. That that's one thing that I try to because it can be confusing. People are like, wait a minute, you see a sell signal, but you guys are the big money and don't you want to be, you know, selling? There are sometimes there, there, see, there's points in the market where everything goes for sale. Okay, so you have to kind of say, does that mean this stock has changed its fundamentals or is there something bigger that is going on? And that's what we try to do with the big money index is, you know, are the bids fading? And, and they have been for the past few weeks. I mean, the BMI has gone straight down, you know, so under yeah, the so surface. With good. that, and I, I just didn't want to forget about that great point that you wrote on the board behind you. So if the big money index is falling, the Check. bids are evaporating. Yep. And some guy, some fund decided to get a little too big for their britches and it goes the wrong way and they get the tap on the shoulder from their banker. You've got to get out or I'm doing it for you. Then liquidity becomes oxygen. Why? Because there, there just might be no bid. You know, you got to sell a stock down $15. That actually happens. And horrible. people don't realize this. Sometimes you get in these illiquid products. And this reminds me of SPACs years ago. And I know there's a lot of SPAC lovers out there, but they used to be roach motels. And um, sometimes you go to find the other side, right? Because you got into the name, you <laughs> bought into the story. It felt good. The liquidity was there. Months later, years later, you need to come out of that thing, basically, when the liquidity dries up, you start saying, where's your bid? There's some people who always have a bid that are like, you know, I, I'm, I'm 10 cents at $19. I mean, and people haven't seen, <laughs> you know, the pain that, that can happen. Pain. And that's why we focus on great stocks. And while you might miss out on some of this near term momentum, you know, people even reached out, says, you know, why don't you change your models a little bit? You know, because there's a lot of names that don't have great fundamentals, but they're going up, up and up. And the story that I think you just have to keep telling them is when the bids fade, you will understand why, because quality is going to bounce. Crap is going to fall like a rock. And we have a buddy that likes to say, you know, there are points, you know, if you're in the wrong type of stocks, you will experience pain like you have never felt before. And it's true. Oh, it stinks. So that is our outlier of the week is actually an outlier event. Fund liquidations on the orders of tens of billions of dollars do not happen every single day. And yeah. if you go back and you look at some of the price action of crazy volatile stocks last week, that is why. Um, so that's really Interesting you know. as far as the data goes, as we told you, the big money index is falling. We're not seeing a whole lot of buyers show up to the table. Again, uh, 
fourth quarter earnings 2020 ended a couple of weeks ago. First quarter earnings 2021 is happening in a couple of weeks. Going back to our data and the blog post, the hangover helper, I think, if you went looked in that, yeah. we made a prediction based just on 30 years of data that the markets would peak uh, sometime in January. It happened in February. We predicted the big money index would peak in January. It did uh, subsequently rallied a little bit. And then um, we were off by about one, between one and 3% of the S&P's highs for both those events. So we were very timely on that. And the important part of the prediction said, April 19th, markets are going to trough. And I remember I felt ridiculous. I felt like a fool writing that because the market was just going up every no. day. I was like, Ugh. nobody wanted to hear it. And that's the other thing, you know, that kind of goes with what we're saying is, isn't it funny that when markets start to fall under pressure, the news headlines change? Yeah. Right. It never happens when we're going to the moon. Right. Because then you see everybody's marching out onto the TV and they're just like, I think we're going to a billion. And here's <laughs> why. And everything's changed. And you can't get any whisper of something negative. And so while those predictions were data based, they were not based around feels or anything like that. Um, you know, even when you're three, four, two weeks off, three weeks off, people write you off. They're like, this guy's lost his mind. Yeah. So, and three weeks in the, in the scheme of the market is, is really not that much, but so the market is sort of chop city right now, up, down, up, down. Uh, we're sort of in a downtrend yep. and then all of a sudden it feels like it reverses. So we'll have to see, but if the market does indeed trough, as we predicted somewhere around April 19th, that kind of makes sense because earnings season is about to start. And yep. you think about year over year comps from first quarter last year, let's not forget things were already slowing down in February. March was abysmal, right? Nobody knew what was going on, COVID. So year over year comps, although analysts already expect it, it's yep. going to be good and we're going to see great Crazy. stocks bounce. So we believe things will start stabilizing. Our data said so, uh, April 19th. So keep that date on your, put a pin in it. Um, but we're always looking for outlier stocks, which brings us to our outlier stock of the week. So yep. do I have share capability here? Let's Why see. We see. Nope, you need to enable me. Let's do it, my friend. So Let's... while you're doing that, uh, we're just going to talk about this stock for a moment, which is one of our all-time faves is MasterCard. Oh, that's Why? a great one. That was our first options trade that you and I did together years ago. Oh, man, this is such a great company. And it used another to... one that got away. It was another one that got <laughs> away. It was one of those, I, I do, I remember when this thing was like eight, nine, ten billion dollars. I'm talking back in the day. And even as a young buck, I was like, there's no way this company is only worth that. So the options trade was, was a great setup. We bought some calls on this. I think we paid a quarter for them. They were the 125 strike. It was going into earnings. Pre-split. Pre-split. Uh, they did a 10 for one split you know, years <laughs> later. When you do 10 for one splits, you're doing something right. And um, we, I remember we made like 10 X on that and it was, it was, it felt good. It looked good. So, um, so let's yeah. uh, I'm going to share my screen. Um, Go ahead. And we are going to look at that. Uh, let's just head over to here. So, 10 for one split, if we were buying the 125 call, I think it was, or something like that. You want to scroll down a little bit? So we yeah, the, the stock is trading at $400. So that would have been the equivalent of $12.5. So this was sometime back in here, right? right? It was a 10 for one split. So if it's a $350 stock, it would have been a $35 stock. Uh, right. Yes. As of today. But if we were buying the 125 calls and they, they were at the money would have been twelve and a half dollars. So it was a long time ago. Guys, are right. Genius. Yep. <laughs> so we're talking somewhere around here. 2008, yeah. 2008, 2009. We sold we bought those calls. We wrote it. We made our 
couple thousand bucks, high fived each other and then proceeded for the next decade or so to watch it go through the moon. So all that green, like you'd like to say the stairway to heaven over here is the times it appeared on the top 20 buy report. So you got to think there's a lot more green. Now, to the point about when things come under pressure and people got to get out, you know, right here, uh, it's hard to see, but that's right around October. That's around election time when things got a little bumpy. Yep. We had some red. So yep. does red mean sell an outlier stock? No. Red probably means sell a weak stock with weak fundamentals, weak sales and earnings, but MasterCard's got phenomenal sales and earnings, yep. phenomenal revenue growth, phenomenal profitability. So that was actually a gift when people were crying uncle at around 280 bucks and the stock went and rallied nearly a hundred dollars. So and, and like there was lots, a, excuse me, there, there were, there were a lot of stocks that were selling off during that period too. And that was when we had our big election prediction that was based on data that they were going to sell stocks in general ahead of the election and then buy them after the election. That is just a, um, a theme that we've seen every four years and we stuck with it. And listen, that red, as you're saying, based on data and based on the setup and based on um, the reopening of the economy with, you know, ways to treat the, the virus and all that kind of stuff, it was the right move to be bullish. Now, the last thing I want to add is right around the time we were buying calls on the stock, in, in our gray area here, that's back-tested data, but that's when it uh, first appeared on our top 20 report back in 2007. The stock rallied 2,000% since then. So great outlier stock, great one to study. This, you know, this red, everything going under pressure. Think of stocks that might have that sort of um, look to them last Friday. Yeah. Because it doesn't mean everybody run out. It means, you know, the strong and smart know when to run in and know when to run out. So uh, just yeah. interesting. Yeah. And that's the the other thing is to try, try and put some, some context of, you know, markets have to cool off sometimes. Stocks have to cool off. You know, you can't just go straight up forever. And people forget that, right? They get diamond hands in their head. You know, they start to think about the moon. You see the laser eyes. I see that's really <laughs> popular right now. You know, when you're really bullish, you want to let everybody know, but you know, the right now we're, we're in a period where there is some volatility. Um, you've got the Dow Jones, which is basically going up. Right. And then you've got the S and P, which is basically flat, but the NASDAQ and the Russell are basically doing this dance and this tug of war. And, um, you know, all of that stuff is, it's just, it's factor motivated, you know, it is position motivated, and the open you, versus tech and it's and yeah it. i mean it's it's you can't get too carried away with you know the the oohs and ahs you know you just got to stay focused well yeah and especially if you're able to step back from the daily noise and the fluctuations and even the weekly and even if the markets are volatile by a quarter or even six months look over the long term that is what we do we looked at 30 years of data we always come back to this statistic, the outlier, the, the Besson Binder paper that said 4% of stocks accounted for 100% the net gains above treasuries for 100 years. So if you're playing in the 96% of stocks, you're wasting your time. So if you focus all your time and energy finding those outliers, you know, the daily fluctuations become a little less meaningful. As a matter of fact, you're probably looking for those moments where there's volatility and there's blood and fear, because that's where you, you find great deals on outlier stocks. If you can say you play in that tiny little sliver of 4% or even yep. better yet, the 1% that account for 50% of the gains, well, focusing all your effort on finding those stocks, you can learn to look at volatility through a different lens. Yeah. I think, you know, you just got to be a little picky which by the way, you know, as we start to wrap up here, I think people need to also be aware that on YouTube, we are starting to do a uh, monthly series. So we used to do these in uh, write-ups and people thought they were very popular. And each month we're going to be doing the best growth stocks and then also best dividend stocks. And, you know, people 
need to know that we've there are great dividend stocks out there as well as growth stocks. So check that out. It's it's free. You can learn about the process. It is very, mm. you know, you know, strap on the boots. Just talk about stocks. Have fun. And uh, you know, if you're not having fun, you know, you're probably doing something wrong because it is a lot of fun when you're buying great companies. Well, maybe that's something to talk about the next time we do a podcast is the outlier like returns you can get from really perceivedly boring dividend stocks through the magic of compounding and Ooh. reinvesting. But we can uh, let us know if that's something you're interested in. Either way, Lucas, it's been really fun. Uh, it has. Always love talking to you, my man. Yeah, no, it's really good. And I think this was a great one this week because we actually have experience of, you know, dealing with liquidations, uh, hearing those orders just come onto the pad, um, used to that make these noise. I still hear them to this day. I still now feel and my hands shaking. <laughs> I still talk to some of our, our clients and I can still hear, you know, when they would send them in. And, you know, that's what happened probably on Friday is somebody from up top sent these big orders down to the traders. They saw it. They probably go, oh my gosh. They probably had to edit their, uh, you know, because you can only do so many shares and you, then you have to do an override. But, um, you know, guys, you just got to hang in there. And these little events, they tend to be, tend to be opportunities. So um, stay but bullish. As you, as you pointed it out, even the great financial crisis you go a long enough timeline, that was a great opportunity. It felt awful at the time to even consider that. Mm. But Look anyhow, we are now. Yeah. let's talk more. Let's do this again. Let's yeah. have lunch next time while we do this. Maybe we'll <laughs> eat here as, uh, as we wrap up. So guys, remember, like, subscribe, comment, any of this type of stuff. We're trying to make this better. We're trying to make this some really good, impactful, unique content straight from the source. The horse's mouth. The horse's mouth. So <laughs> with that, I'll see you later, my man. Talk to you later. Have a good one. Thanks for tuning in. And please remember, this broadcast is intended for entertainment purposes only. Investments can carry substantial risks. Before you make a financial decision, you should first consult your financial advisor.